Hi all, Dr. Clark here again with another general biology lecture. Today we're going to finish off the biomolecules. Okay, Last time we talked about proteins. This time we're going to try to slam in nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and lipids all together. Now um, nucleic acids is going to be really short because we will spend multiple lectures talking about DNA and RNA and ATP and so we're not going to cover much on nucleic acids. Carbohydrates and lipids, we'll come back and we'll talk more about them when we talk about car, uh, photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So um, with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, chuck through this fairly quickly. Okay, So here you can see this is a DNA molecule and it's showing you um, the DNA molecule is copying. Okay, so it's showing you how DNA is copied. DNA is copied in two directions. One called the lagging strand, which is built in Okazaki fragments. And one that's called the leading strand, which is built continuously. We'll come back to this, but today we'll, we'll introduce nucleic acids and DNA. Okay? And then this here is showing you a lipid bilayer here, okay, which is what the membranes of our cells are made out of. Okay, and we're going to talk about that in the next lecture when we talk about cell membranes and, and cells in general. And then this is called a mysocell. And this is what happens when, lipid, when lipids are added to water. And so it's a spontaneous arrangement of lipids, okay? creating this polar heads on the outside, um, Nonpolar heads on the or nonpolar tails on the inside, okay. And um, this right here, this mysocell, could be the connection, okay. And from most scientists' standpoint, is the connection um, with non-living to living, okay. It's one of the key components that ability for non-living lipids to form a makeshift cell spontaneously. Okay? We'll, we'll approach that again at a later date when we start talking about the potentials of evolution, etc. Okay, so nucleic acids. There's two general types of nucleic acids. Most of you are familiar with them. Deoxyribonucleic acids, or DNA, and ribonucleic acids, or RNA. Okay? They are similar to each other except for RNA has uracil, uracil as one of its nitrogenous bases instead of thymine. Okay? RNA is single-stranded, however, at times it will coil with itself to look double-stranded. Okay? So transfer RNA, anytime RNA copies itself, okay? these kind of things, RNA can be double-stranded, but it is just a single strand. And RNA has a ribosugar instead of a deoxyribosugar, okay? Which means off the second prime or second carbon in the five carbon ring, there is a hydroxide group instead of a hydrogen group, okay? And we'll come to that and, and look at it in greater detail. Okay? So the structure itself of DNA is double helix, and one of the main reasons for that is Chargoff's rule. So Edwin Chargoff came up with this rule that adenine always binds with thymine okay? and guanine always binds with cytosine. Okay? And this really has to do with this, well, this action of always binding with this uh, one pair or always having the same pair keeps the DNA molecule kind of an equal width. Okay? And so adenine has two carbon rings, okay? and thymine has a single carbon ring. And so when you combine it, you have a triple carbon ring. Okay? Guanine has two, cytosine has one, and you have a triple carbon ring. And so by doing that, it doesn't matter whether it's adenine, thymine, or guanine, cytosine laid down along the DNA molecule. It is the same width, okay? approximately the same width. Okay, no matter where you look. Okay? That allows for a uniform double helix to form. Okay? And we'll, we'll come back to this and look at this. Okay? 
Now that these nitrogenous bases, adenine and thymine, okay, and cytosine and guanine, they're held together with hydrogen bonds. And remember, we said hydrogen bonds are these weak forces, okay, of you know this electronegativity force where you know one positive is kind of attracted to a negative, okay. But it's not weak when we start talking about thousands of bonds. So adenine and thymine, there are two hydrogen bonds between them. Okay? And cytosine and guanine, there are three hydrogen bonds. Okay? Well, you, the human genome, is made of about three billion base pairs. Okay? Three billion adenine, cytosine, thymine, guanines. Okay? And they're paired. Okay? And so if you look at that, at minimum, we're talking about six billion bonds, hydrogen bonds, in the human genome. That's a lot, and that makes DNA actually very stable, okay? much more stable than RNA, okay? and um, makes it very useful as kind of a storage molecule. And we'll come back when we're talking about DNA in more detail, that that's probably how DNA evolved, is RNA evolved first, but DNA is more stable than RNA and probably evolved as that storage molecule. The other bonds that are important are outside of the nitrogenous bases along what we call the, the rails or the backbone of DNA are sugar phosphate bonds, okay? And they're called phosphodiester bonds. But in short, most, you know, geneticists, most biologists just call them ester bonds, okay? But they, it's a bond between a sugar and a phosphate group. Okay. and it's coming off the fifth carbon on the carbon ring. Okay. And we'll look at that in a little bit. Okay. But here you can see DNA, double helix. Okay. You can see that triple hydrogen bond between cytosine and guanine, that double hydrogen bond between adenine and thymine. Here you can see the phosphate group okay, bound to the sugar, okay. and that's a phosphodiester bond there. And we'll approach this a little bit more as we progress, okay? So the structure of DNA, and okay, this goes back to the original kind of lecture when I said structure determines function, okay? That's exactly true for DNA also, okay? So it's not just at the, you know, large um, actual physical features like, you know, your thumb determines its function, it's the way it's structured, the things, the fact that it's an opposable thumb and it can move and rotate, it does determine its function. But even at the molecular level, the structure of the molecule really determines its function. We talked about this when we were talking about activation sites on proteins, okay, or enzymes, okay, and, um, and it holds true for DNA also. And because it's double helix, okay, and because one strand of the DNA is running from what we call five prime to three prime. So it runs from the fifth carbon on the sugar to the third carbon on the sugar, okay? So it's moving in this direction. But then if you look at the other strand, okay, it's moving in the opposite direction. It's anti-parallel. So it's running from five prime to three prime, okay? Because DNA is anti-parallel parallel, and a mirror image of each other, okay? So these are mirror images. It helps for the fact that we can unzip the DNA, we can break those hydrogen bonds, and we can build a new strand on this old strand and a new strand on this old strand. Okay? And we can copy our DNA and get an exact copy of our DNA. So the hydrogen bonds, again, can be broken or unzipped. Okay? Um, there's an enzyme called helicase that does this, and we'll come back and we'll talk more about helicase and other um, processes by doing this, but those hydrogen bonds can just be broken real quick. And remember, this is done in solution. This is done in water. Okay, so when those hydrogen bonds are being broken, it we have what are called binding proteins that hold the DNA open. But when the binding proteins are removed, it just slaps back together and forms new hydrogen bonds because it's in water. And remember that in in water, okay, substances that can dissolve in water, like DNA, okay, 
a DNA has a negative charge, slightly negative charge, so it's polar, okay? Um, they're going to form hydrogen bonds often, okay? And so DNA will reform its hydrogen bonds very quickly after being unzipped, recopied, or unzipped, okay? And this, the binding proteins are removed. We'll come back to it, okay? So again, DNA is a mirror image. That allows us for us to get two copies of the information, okay? And each copy it can be accurately copied, and essentially, whenever you are going to pass this information to the next generation, okay, whether that be sexual um, reproduction, okay, there's going to be some changes. We'll get to meiosis, okay? That's sexual reproduction, or whether this is asexual reproduction, and that's mitosis the DNA still is going to be copied and passed on. One is not going to be an identical copy, meiosis, and one is an identical copy, mitosis. Okay? But you can think of this as just getting a little cut on your hand. Okay? The cells around that are going to start copying their DNA and start multiplying, but you want to make sure that that cut is filled in with the same cells and the same DNA in all those cells. Okay? And this is the way that it happens. Okay, before we move on or move away from nucleic acid, I really just want to kind of talk about two books. One, we're going to watch a video on it. Well, you will have the opportunity to do an extra credit assignment on the video. Um, okay, the double helix, uh, this is this was written by James Watson, who you might know, Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA, along with Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins. Okay, Rosalind Franklin did not receive the Nobel Prize for it, because she passed away prior to them getting the Nobel Prize, but Maurice Wilkins did. Okay, so together those four individuals discovered the structure of DNA. Now, this book is about how they discovered it, and it's an excellent book. And the movie that we'll watch called The Race for the Double Helix okay, is loosely based on this book. Okay? And um, so you can, if you're into reading the book before you watch the video, um, you might want to pick this book up. The other book here is also by James Watson. Okay? But this book is, if, you know, if you're out there and you're interested in basically replacing me um, as an instructor, okay, as a professor at a college, I highly suggest um, reading James Watson's Avoid Boring People. Um, and uh, it's, it's an excellent book about academia, about um, being a professor, um, being a scholar, and this kind of stuff. Um, it's a great book. I really enjoyed reading it, and I try to hold um, kind of myself to this kind of piece of information or piece of literature that James Watson wrote. Okay. Anyways, I'll put the links for both these books um, down below. Okay. Carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are just kind of a you know a more technical term for sugars. Okay. And um, Carbohydrates in today's society often get kind of a bad rap. They get kind of a bad name. It's you're almost linking carbohydrates to fats, okay? And fats have always had kind of this bad um, vibe to them um, from a nutritionist point of view. But I'll tell you, carbohydrates. The you know our planet would be nothing without carbohydrates. Okay? Carbohydrates are the building blocks for all energy. Okay. So when we talk about fats, okay, carbohydrates are the building blocks for those fats. Carbohydrates are the building blocks for the protein. And carbohydrates give the energy in order to um, make nucleic acids. It's carbohydrates that are really the baseline of all energy when we're talking about metabolic energy. Okay? Now the great thing about carbohydrates is they have a very um, essential energy storage mechanism okay, and we'll come to that okay but on top of that carbohydrates are made per se okay so they are developed 
inside plants based on free energy. Okay, so when we're talking about other things, proteins, when we're talking about fats, okay, nucleic acids, this is often not coming from free energy, okay, unless carbohydrates were, were built. Okay, um, carbohydrates is, is coming from photons. Okay, so photons from the sun. That energy is utilized to make chemical energy or bond energy. It's then that bond energy that can drive the production of proteins, that can drive the production of nucleic acids, drive the production of lipids, drive the production of more carbohydrates. Okay, but without the initial building blocks of carbohydrates, okay, nothing else would occur. Okay, so I just want to make sure that when you think of carbohydrates, I know people are on carbohydrate diets. Lots of people are. Okay, don't think of carbohydrates as being bad. Think of carbohydrates as being essential. Okay, and when you diet, really the key to all diets is burn more energy than you take in. Okay, if you want to lose weight, okay, if you want to become more fit, the key to all diets is burn more energy, more calories than you take in. Okay? Eat, you know, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Okay? I highly suggest following, you know, a typical nutrition uh, guide with, you know, certain number of grains, certain number of proteins, certain number of you know, carbohydrates, fruits, vegetables, things like that. Those guides are much better than trying to just cut all carbohydrates out of your diet. Okay? But my opinion only, okay? and we'll talk more about carbohydrates now. Okay? So from a biological standpoint and a chemical standpoint, um, you'll know that you're dealing with a carbohydrate when you see a one to two to one ratio of carbon hydrogen to oxygen. Okay? And so carbohydrates molecules now in their most stable form will have this one to two to one ratio. Okay? The size of the carbohydrate will vary. Okay? Simple carbohydrates will often consist of maybe one or two monomers. Okay? Simple sugars as we, we often call them. Okay? Comple complex carbohydrates will be long polymers. So you might have uh, multiple simple carbohydrates linked together to make a long polymer or you might just have a bunch of monomers linked together um, to form these long polymer chains. Okay. So simple carbohydrates, probably the most famous one um, that most people know is glucose, C6H12O6. Again, that is a one to two to one ratio of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. These are monosaccharides, okay, or single sugars, okay. Um, and glucose is probably uh, the most important one. Okay, majority of plants that um, go through photosynthesis, okay, all plants do, but majority of them are creating glucose. At least initially, they're creating glucose, and then in some regions of the organism, they're creating fructose, which also has a C6 H12O6 um, chemical formula. It's just the arrangement's a little bit different. Disaccharides okay, are typically two monosaccharides linked together. Okay? And one of the ones that is probably the most famous okay, and most often utilized by humans and, and other organisms um, okay, are sucrose molecules. Okay? And sucrose is the mixture of glucose and fructose. Okay? And so you can think of sucrose is table sugar. Okay? So you take a little bit of table sugar, put it in your coffee, whatever, drink it down. Sucrose encounters sucrase, that enzyme, that enzyme will break that sucrose molecule into glucose and fructose. Now, the more complex the carbohydrate, often the more energy it will hold, but also often the more processes it has to go through in order to break down. So the more biochemical pathways, the more enzymes it might have to encounter to break down um, that carbohydrate. But also the more complex the carbohydrate, okay, 
the more stable it is as a you know storage molecule so we're going to look at some of these as we progress okay? but here you can see glucose over here fructose over here okay same chemical formula just a little bit different in arrangement between the two molecules nonetheless you can see that we have a dehydration reaction when these two form hydroxide group of fructose okay binds with the hydrogen of glucose water is formed it's lost okay energy has to be supplied in order for this bond to form but now you have sucrose okay now complex carbohydrates are those long polymer chains okay and because you have these long chains and it's this combination of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen okay complex carbohydrates will often have a massive number of carbon hydrogen bonds okay? and the more carbon hydrogen bonds you have the more potential energy you have because each one of those bonds is energy okay? and when you break it energy is released okay? and so most organisms will have these really complex carbohydrates as long-term long storage molecules energy storage molecules and we call these polysaccharides, okay? These long complex carbohydrates means that there's multiple sugars linked together, multiple saccharides linked together, okay? So let's look at a couple um, examples of polysaccharides or complex sugars when it comes to plants and animals, okay? Plants often store carbohydrates in the form of starch, okay? And so you got these long chains of glucose molecules linked together to form starch and animals when they take in glucose and extra energy they'll often store store these carbohydrates as glycogen inside their muscle okay? and sometimes this is just called muscle glycogen okay? or sometimes people refer to it as muscle carbohydrates or muscle sugars okay um, but really, it's these long polysaccharide chains that are stored inside our muscle, which allows us to break them down and do work. Okay? And we'll, we'll look at how this plays a role in, say, exercise and things like that as we progress. Okay? Now, some polysaccharides are so complex that um, most enzymes can't degrade them, can't react to them, okay? Or there are no enzymes available to um, dismantle them, okay? And these are some very specialized polysaccharides, and they're really not used for energy storage, but instead they're used for structural support, okay? Plants do this in the form of cellulose, okay? So if you're looking at a block of wood, and you're saying, oh, okay, I see this is wood fibers, or, you know, this is wood, okay? That wood fiber or that wood is really just cellulose, okay? It is complex carbohydrates, complex glucose molecules and long, long chains, okay? With some extra bonds uh, outside of, say, hydrogen bonds and things like that, there's some extra bonds involved, okay? But it's really complex and very few organisms have the ability to break it down. Now some organisms break down cellulose, okay? and they do it in a couple different ways. We talked about termites having this beneficial bacteria in their, belly, in their gut okay, that has the enzyme, has the capability of digesting cellulose. Okay? So termites can get around that by having this beneficial bacteria. Other things like you know, ungulates, so cattle and things like that, they might have to take in a bunch of cellulose and then ferment it, okay? And cause, you know, along with the bacteria, beneficial bacteria in their stomach, but also along with the, that, you have this production of alcohol that allows for the cellulose to break down and the carbohydrates to be used, okay? The other form, the animal form, is chitin, okay? Chitin is the substance, the complex carbohydrate that makes up exoskeletons. So 
organisms that are invertebrates, they don't have vertebrate columns, they don't have an internal skeleton, will often have an external skeleton. Okay? And the skeleton would cover their soft body. This is made of chitin or complex carbohydrates. And um, there's not very many organisms that can break that down. There's very few enzymes that can break down chitin. Okay? So it allows them to have this, you know, external armor okay, that is, you know, fortified and really difficult to break down. Okay? So here you can see these polysaccharide chains to make cellulose. Okay, multiple glucose molecules linked together in these long, long chains to make these kind of wood fibers that make up cell walls. Okay, so there's lots of carbohydrates out there. It's very simple ones like lac lactose and sucrose and then more energy complex storage molecules like starch and glycogen okay? and then of course the ones that are more used for structural purposes like cellulose and chitin. Okay? All right that brings me to lipids. So lipids, fats, okay and other molecules that are not water soluble. So these are nonpolar molecules. Okay? They will not form hydrogen bonds with water. Okay? So they are hydrophobic. Okay? Now, often we just think when we hear lipids, we think of fat, but there are lots of different molecules that make up lipids. Okay? Of course, fats and oils, but other things that are important for reproductive purposes things like steroids and, and hormones, okay? rubbers, waxes, pigments, okay? all kinds of these things um, are, are lipid based okay? and um, important for many different things. Okay? So waxes and things like that, um, like cuticle layers on plant leaves. So if you look at the shiny side of a plant leaf, Okay, that's the cuticle layer. That's a waterproofing wax okay, that's made out of lipids. Okay? And so anything that's really kind of waterproof based um, is going to have the properties of lipids. Now it could be synthetic, okay, but if it's naturally made, it's going to have lipid, a lipid base to it okay, because it's not going to dissolve in, in water. Now lipids are great um, for fat uh, or for energy storage, long-term energy storage. They're much more um, rigid and less likely to break down under you know heating processes and things like that. So uh, they're a much longer energy storage molecule. So. If you take in too much glucose, too many carbohydrates, okay, your carbohydrates, okay, your acetyl-CoA, okay, so glucose gets converted into what we call pyruvate. Pyruvate then gets processed into acetyl-CoA. If you have too much acetyl-CoA, okay, instead of using it to form ATP, that acetyl-CoA will be converted into fat, okay, long-term energy storage. Okay. This is a really, really good process. It might not be a good process for people in the United States and Europe and China and Japan and these developed countries where energy is not limited. So every day, a individual in most of these countries, um, these developed countries, most individuals can, at any point in time, get more than 2,000 calories in, diet, in their diet very easily. And because of that, if they're not expending that amount of energy, they're storing that, okay? And this is why we have an issue with people being overweight or obese in all developed countries have these issues, okay? And it's really because energy is not limited. People take in more energy than they expend. That glucose, that energy is being converted into fats, okay? Now, Fats are really just two subunits, okay? You have a fatty acid tail, which is made of hydrocarbons, and we'll get to that. And then you have a glycerol head, and, and how this, or glycerol portion. Sometimes it's called the glycerol backbone. Some people call it glycerol head, okay, off the tail. But regardless, um, 
you have two kind of subunits. The fatty acids are where the majority of the energy comes from because there's a massive amount of carbon to hydrogen bonds, okay, or what we call hydrocarbons. They'll end in kind of a carboxyl group, okay, but the length of the hydrocarbons differs between different types of fats, okay, and then how many hydrogens are bonded on there determines kind of the chemical uh, behavior of that molecule. Okay? And we'll get to that in a second. Okay? So here you can see a bunch of carbon-hydrogen bonds here, okay? these hydrocarbons. Okay? There is your um, you know, glycerol backbone, sometimes called glycerol head. Okay? This is probably the most common fat, at least when we're talking about animal fats. Um, is triglycerides. Okay, so you have three fatty acid tails, okay, and three kind of glycerol heads or glycerol pieces. Okay, um, that doesn't mean that there's not diglycerides with two fatty acid tails and monoglycerides with a single fatty acid tail. There are. Okay, it's just this is the most common form that we see um, in animals uh, when it comes to fats. Okay. Now, the other thing about fatty acids, like I just said, the number of hydrocarbon uh, linkages or hydrogens on those carbons really dictates the chemical property of that molecule. So if you're at maximum number of hydrogens, so you have the maximum number of hydrogens linked to the carbons, okay, the fat is considered to be saturated, saturated with hydrogens. If you have fewer than the maximum, okay, so in other words, you might have some carbons that are double bonded to each other, okay, um, that fat is considered unsaturated. Okay. So here you can just see what I'm talking about. So here you have three fatty acid tails, still a triglyceride, okay, but you, you can see there is no kink. Okay. A double bonded carbon is going to cause a little kink in the tail. Okay. Here, this is maximum number of hydrocarbons okay, or hydrogens to carbon. Okay. This is not the maximum number. Okay. Now, another significant difference between these two is if you have the maximum number at room temperature, you're going to be solid. Okay. If you have less than the maximum number at room temperature, you're going to be a liquid. Now, there's been debates on and on and on by different nutritionists, different diets, things like that, on which one's better for you, saturated which, or unsaturated, okay? I'm not gonna get into that debate um, because, you know, there's, there's differences, okay? It's, it's probably not which one's better for you, but um, overall, how much are you using, okay? That's probably where the debate is really um, relevant, okay? Now we're going to watch a quick little video about what is utilized, what energy source is utilized when you exercise. Because a lot of people don't understand where the energy is coming from during an exercise program. Muscles can obtain energy for physical activity from at least four sources of energy nutrients. These are muscle glycogen, muscle triglycerides, plasma-free fatty acids, and blood glucose. At the start of an exercise regime, muscle glycogen provides nearly half of the required energy. Muscle triglycerides and plasma-free fatty acids provide about a quarter each. And only a small amount is contributed by blood glucose. One hour into the activity, the proportion of energy nutrients utilized has changed. Muscle glycogen is down, as are muscle triglycerides. Now blood glucose and plasma-free fatty acids are providing more of the energy needed. By hour two, the trends are magnified. Muscle glycogen and triglycerides are being consumed faster than they can be replaced. Blood glucose and plasma-free fatty acids provide more and more of the energy needed. At hour three, muscle glycogen and triglycerides are even lower. More than 70% of the muscle's energy needs are now being met by blood glucose and plasma-free fatty acids. 
After four hours, muscle glycogen is fully depleted. Muscle triglycerides contribute less than 10%, and blood glucose and plasma-free fatty acids contribute more than 90% of the required energy. The duration of physical activity determines the source of the energy that fuels the activity. Short-duration exercises are fueled by muscle glycogen and triglycerides, and some plasma-free fatty acids. The muscle glycogen and triglycerides can be replaced easily when the activity is finished. As exercise duration increases, muscles depend more on blood glucose and plasma-free fatty acids for energy. Plasma-free fatty acids arise from the hydrolysis of stored fat. For this reason, most successful weight loss programs include an exercise component. Okay, so from that aspect, I, I just want to provide a little bit of insight. Okay, again, this is my opinion, but it's based on you know data like this. Okay, if you're doping yourself before an exercise, so if you're eating energy bars before your exercise, okay, you're doping your blood glucose. Okay? And so in order to get anything from that energy bar or any positive benefits, you really need to be exercising for roughly two hours. Okay? A better process, and you know, this process is what thing individuals like marathon runners use, is you know, if you they eat high levels of carbohydrates prior to a race, okay? and then after the carbohydrates have been burnt down, okay, so the muscle glycogen has been burnt down, okay, then during the race they're going to eat glucose, okay, in different forms or fructose, okay, and so that's why at you know marathon tables they'll often have orange slices and things like that is to dope your blood with glucose, okay? Because after a certain period, you're now going to be running on glucose. So if you're going to take those energy bars and things like that, I highly suggest work out for the first hour and then take the energy bar, okay? But this is my opinion again, based on, you know, scientific evidence, but still just my opinion. All right, so I don't know what happened there, but um, if you look at some, uh, other pieces and other evidence for lipids and other importance of lipids, okay? It's not just energy storage, but it's also how our membranes are formed. Our membranes of our cells are lipids, okay? Phospholipids, and they make what we call a phospholipid bilayer, okay? So here you can see in this figure, you see these phospholipid heads and tails, okay? That's a phosphate group bound to a fatty acid tail, and then you can see another layer over here, phosphate group bound to fatty acid tails, okay? That makes the cell membrane. The heads are hydrophilic, so they encounter water and they bond to hydrogens in the water, okay? And the tails are hydrophobic, okay? They're afraid of water, per se, okay? But they don't form hydrogen bonds, okay? You can also see here, cholesterol. You can see this cholesterol that's embedded inside this membrane. Okay? And some of you know that there is such thing as, or somewhat such thing as, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Okay? Well, good cholesterol or positive cholesterol will often be bound inside the, the cell membranes okay? and cause the cell to be a little bit, the membrane to be a little bit more rigid. Okay. You don't want the membrane to just be free floating and flex constantly. Okay, so it provides a little bit of rigidity along with the proteins that are embedded in it. You get too much cholesterol, however, you'll get lots of it embedded in here and then your cell is too rigid okay? and it doesn't have enough flex to get around things like plaque and blockages that might occur in the vein and the artery and even capillary systems which can cause heart attacks, strokes, and cardiovascular disease when it comes to the, those points. We'll come back to that later, okay? All right, so moving from here, we're gonna start talking about cells, okay? And so we're gonna dive into the basics of cells and then talk about 
the components of cells and how they work. Okay. All right. Till next time.